It's very clear that relief from trauma almost always involves deliberately bringing oneself back into the state of mind and body that occurred during the trauma. In a world inundated with information, it's rare to come across something truly important that can transform your life. And yet here it is, a video that holds the key to unlocking a better you. The urgency in these words reveal the way to the message, emphasizing the significance of what he's about to reveal. This is not just a suggestion or a passing thought, it's a proclamation that can no longer be concealed. Prepare to confront the truth that awaits, for there is no alternative path to achieving a superior version of yourself. With an air of promise, this video promises to deliver the most effective and vital facts that can reshape your existence. Embrace this opportunity, for the secrets it holds have the potential to revolutionize your life forever. Don't hesitate any longer. It's time to uncover the transformative power within. You know, even though they are controversial, one um, can't help but notice the, the work of, for instance, Matthew Johnson, who's at uh, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and he's looking at macrodose psilocybin for the treatment of trauma and depression. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to Matt directly and I said, you know, what is the key element of a successful therapeutic session? Because he was telling me, you know, one person is having one experience, another person is having another experience. So there's, there's nothing to anchor this. And he said, it's the quote unquote, letting go and allowing their autonomic arousal to be taken over by something else. And I thought, well, the data are pretty impressive, but that's the exact opposite of what we're talking about in terms of ketamine type therapies. I think hypnosis kind of resides in the middle in that it, it involves going into the state that creates the anxiety, trauma, or, or pain, and then actively dissociating mm -hmm. from that state in a way that you re actively replace it with another state. Psychedelic therapies are still very poorly understood. You know, one of the things that I think is important to emphasize is we always hear such and such opens plasticity, such and such, a, you know, plasticity is a process, uh, you, like digestion or something like that. You don't necessarily want to open plasticity because all sorts of things can happen in there. And I'm aware of people that have benefited tremendously from psychedelic therapies. I'm also aware of people that have suffered tremendously from psychedelic therapies. And I have a colleague at Stanford, also in psychiatry, whose name is Nolan Williams. He does transcranial magnetic stimulation. He's an expert and a researcher and clinician in understanding depression and tools to explore that. And he has studies that he's performing now, looking at people, the brains of people who have undergone different forms of psychedelic therapies with no bias whatsoever as to whether or not they're beneficial or not, but really to highlight the individual differences before, not during, but then after the psychedelic therapies. And so I think there's still a lot to be learned. I yeah. mean, we are, uh, you know, as much as we understand mechanisms and brain areas, and there's some s successes out there and some failures out there in psychiatry and neuroscience. I mean, we're still groping around in the dark, more or less, in terms of figuring out like what these compounds do. Mm -hmm. And a big effort, in large part led by a group up at UC Davis, some people are gonna be dismayed by this, uh, but a big uh, effort is being made to take these drug compounds, remove the hallucinogenic components from them, and ask whether or not there are other aspects to their biology that have nothing to do with hallucinating or the letting go or the um, other aspects of psychedelic journeys in order to figure out whether or not something else in those compounds is, is allowing the brain to readjust itself. Yeah, interesting. Right, because we there are, there are a lot of variables in, in a psycho, uh, you know, psychedelic journey. It's mm. not necessarily the case that the hallucination or the disruption of time and space is the thing that's rewiring the brain. So there's a lot to be learned. In this video, we're presented with significant insights that can't be overlooked. It's as if a light has been shown under these truths that have been hiding in the dark, waiting to be discovered. They stand out in bold relief, demanding our attention and refusing to be ignored. These insights are like pieces of a puzzle that, once put together, reveal a clear picture. They help us to understand better, to learn, to grow. These insights can't be hidden like a book that's been opened. They're out there for all to see, to ponder, to take action on. They challenge us, they provoke us, and, and they inspire us to see the world in a different light. Their power lies in the visibility and the impact that they have on our perceptions and our attitudes. We can't hide from these insights. They're right here, and they're compelling us to pay attention and engage with them. Uh, you know, I'm excited by all these things. I certainly don't want to encourage, um, you know, kind of maverick use of these things. Many of them are still scheduled drugs, so they can land you in jail, right? Um, I think hypnosis, and for at least for me, um, lands in a category of, you know, interesting and intriguing for people to explore. It's certainly non-invasive. You would definitely want to work with somebody very, very good who also has some clinical training 
in dealing with trauma, mm -hmm. uh, who also has some clinical training in dealing with whatever it is that people are dealing with, because there's been success with eating disorders, which is which are very, very challenging in the abs. Even with medication, those can be very, very challenging. Um, ADHD and some of the other clin yeah. clinical syndromes. In the ever-evolving field of neuroscience, groundbreaking discoveries are continuously being made that have the potential to transform our understanding of the human mind. The notion that certain habits can profoundly impact our growth and development is an exciting revelation. It brings to light the idea that our minds possess an incredible plasticity, and they're capable of tremendous change. These findings emphasize the importance of embracing knowledge and actively seeking ways to expand our cognitive capabilities. By acknowledging that this information can't be concealed, we open ourselves up to a world of possibilities. The insights gained by neuroscientists globally offer a roadmap to personal growth and improvement. If ever there was a phenomenon in life that I'm struck by, <laughs> is uh, it's trauma. And, um, you know, it's, it's incredible to me how, you know, we experience these things uh, to some, for some people more than others, right? Um, you know, to some extent, everyone has trauma to some extent. I, I think we need to be fair and say that some people have a tremendous amount of trauma and other people less. Um, but that there are some consistent themes that the psychoanalysts actually had right, which is that for many people, there's this, what the analysts would call a repetition compulsion, right? Somebody experiences something really terrible as a child. And then as an adult, there's, they find themselves seeking out similar types of situations. And it's just the most illogical thing one can imagine. And the analysts would say, well, this is a reparative wish, an attempt to subconsciously throw oneself back into these scenarios to get a different outcome. So, you know, trauma is fascinating in that way. I mean, what do we know about trauma? It's very clear that relief from trauma in some way or another, almost always involves going, deliberately bringing oneself back into the state of mind and body that occurred during the trauma. As horrible as that might seem, avoiding that seems to be an issue. And then gradually, or hopefully quickly, but in some cases gradually desensitizing oneself to that experience as not just a overwhelming, horrible experience, but a sad but no longer overwhelming experience so that they can gain some sort of um, ability to think inside of the, the memory. In this video, we are presented with fundamental steps that are crucial in developing the habits necessary for personal growth and surpassing our previous selves. The first step highlighted is self-reflection, which involves understanding our strengths and weaknesses. By gaining this self-awareness, we lay the foundation for improvement. The second step emphasizes setting specific goals that provide us with direction and focus. These goals serve as benchmarks to measure our progress and help keep us motivated. Consistency is emphasized as the third step, highlighting the importance of daily commitment to our chosen habits. The fourth step emphasizes accountability through sharing our goals with others or finding an accountability buddy or, you know, an accountability partner if you want to be boring. This helps us stay on track and receive support. Lastly, the video encourages us to embrace failure as a learning opportunity, promoting resilience and adaptability. By following these fundamental steps, we can cultivate habits that enable us to constantly evolve and become better versions of ourselves. One resounding theme that I've collected in talking to trauma therapists and exploring a lot of the, the therapies for trauma is that, you know, oftentimes trauma involves a deep confusion for whatever reason, a deep confusion about who was responsible. And this is something that's somewhat complicated and um, can be troubling to think about, but people will experience a, a trauma a car crash, a, a sexual assault, a um, devastating financial loss can also be a, a trauma. And then somehow in, the, in one's mind, it's not clear whether or not that was something that happened to them or that they created for themselves. Now, the typical script of this was people talking about, oh, you know, I shouldn't have been out that late or dressed that way or acted that way. But it actually can be much more subtle and diabolical than that. It can be that uh, it can start to route into people's own percept of self. Like maybe I'm not worthy of being happy and therefore the fact that this happened makes total sense. People create these, these crazy scripts mm -hmm. and crazy because they don't match any real world facts, but they do match a lot of internal structure. And so it becomes very complex to, to unpack all this. But what we know for sure is that accessing the state of mind and body that resembles the state of mind and body during the trauma is the first step in moving trauma out of the body, so-called trauma release. Now, almost always that has to be done in concert with a really well-trained uh, physician or clinician because that can be overwhelming, right. certainly the first time. There's also some evidence based on some decent studies that show that 
deliberately accessing states of high autonomic arousal that are independent from the trauma. So things like ice baths, things like hard exercise, things like very, very intense experiences separate from the traumatic memory can be useful in allowing people to attain comfort at high levels of autonomic arousal, right? I mean, you're trying to essentially say, you know, go back to this place and work it through, try and get some space or some distance from the emotion. And yet for some people, just an elevation in heart rate is overwhelming for them. And so they're not even gonna set foot on the first step up the mountain when in fact, that's exactly what they need to do. So there's now a, a kind of movement in psychiatry and psychology to bring in more of these, I guess you could call them somatic approaches, but to my mind, they're really physiological approaches. They're really approaches that teach people how to be tolerant of high levels of autonomic arousal.